make an announcement. For anybody who's parking in the Yale parking lot, please make sure not to park in fire lanes or in places that you're not supposed to park because they're starting a policy, apparently, of towing people who are not parked properly. So, so please make sure you're parked properly in the Yale parking lot. Um, Okay, so today we're continuing with the seminar series. We're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Milton Shane with us. He's the uh, professor of Hebrew and Jewish studies at the University of Cape Town. He's an eminent scholar who's widely published on an array of issues. Um, he, he's, sorry, okay, but today he's going to speak on anti-alienism, anti-Semitism, and anti-Zionism in the 20th century in South Africa. So, Well, thank you very much, Charles, and thanks for hosting me this afternoon. Um, I'm going to really be looking at the question of continuities, discontinuities, and contingencies. Looking at anti-alienism initially in South Africa, then anti-Semitism, that's the Jewish question as such, in the 1930s and early 1940s, and the more contemporary period, anti-Zionism, and trying to tease out the continuities and discontinuities and the context in which these forces have operated. And of course, that question has been subject to substantial literature in a general sense, but I'm looking at the South African case specifically. By the early 20th century, a widespread anti-Jewish stereotype had evolved against the backdrop of a large influx of Eastern European Jews, mainly from Lithuania, beginning at the time minerals were discovered in the late 19th century. The newcomers attracted substantial hostile attention in the interior as itinerant peddlers, in particular in the southern Cape region, as traders in the ostrich feather industry, on the diamond fields as fortune seekers associated with illicit diamond dealing, in mining in Johannesburg, on the front as so-called Peruvians, a term unique to South Africa, we can discuss at question time possibly, but they were associated with the senior side of the city's life, including the illicit liquor trade, prostitution, and then as mine magnates or cosmopolitan financiers on the Vagata front who were seen to be bent on dominating the country. Now, the image of the manipulative and dishonest Jew that evolved by the early 20th century must be seen in the context of urbanization and modernization. For the alienated and landless Boers, the Afrikaner community, part of what was emerging as a poor white problem, for them, the Jewish store, at least for some of them, was seen as a symbol of greed and dishonesty. And instead of being appreciated for his or her services, the itinerant Jewish trader and the small shopkeeper, they were blamed for corrupting a rustic world of innocence and harmony. In the urban centers, antipathy was driven by competing merchants, the established English-speaking mercantile class, who considered Jewish trading patterns repugnant. Just to get a sense of the flavor, uh, an English weekly, the Alf, uh, reported on the Jewish traders in the city of Cape Town the following terms. And I'm quoting, the fact is Cape Town at the present time is full of those Polish Jew hawkers who live in dirtier style than Catholics <laughs> and existing on about half a crown a week rob the tradesman of his due. They don't pay rent, rates, or taxes, yet they're allowed to sell goods just the same as if they kept a store. <coughs> Respectable Europeans should order these people from their doors. That is the only way to put them down, let these people do manual work. Far more sinister than the trader was the image of the Jew as part of a network of international finance, a trope well known at this time in Europe. The notion of the cosmopolitan financier found fertile soil in South Africa where mining magnates or landlords 
among whom Jews were disproportionately represented, were such a prominent feature in society. It made little difference that these Jewish financiers had largely assimilated and were Jews in name only. Their presence was particularly highlighted in England by the pro Boers at the time of the Anglo-Boer War, and in letters to the press and cartoon caricatures of a corpulent and Semitic looking financier, these ideas percolated into South Africa. And the conspiratorial view of international finance was most clearly enunciated by the well-known J.A. Hobson, at that time the Manchester Guardian's correspondent in Johannesburg. His sentiments were captured in his book, The War in South Africa, which postulated the war being fought in the interests of a small group of international financiers, chiefly German in origin and Jewish in race, as he put it. These ideas were consolidated after the war, this time in connection with the controversial importation of Chinese labor to replace dwindling African reserves on the mines. Increasingly, the alien plutocrats or the Hebrew gold bugs were portrayed as responsible for the scheme. It was in this climate that Hogenheimer, a quintessential Jewish parvenu, Based on stage character, it's at this time that he became a household name and a visible component of the anti-Jewish stereotype, complementing the Peruvian image that associated with the Jewish trader and the underworld. In the eyes of the anti-Semite, it was the dishonesty of the Peruvian that enabled him to achieve plutocratic eminence. Hogenheimer, allegedly the eminence Gris of South Africa, merely symbolized on a higher plane the machinations of the Jewish peddler and of the illicit diamond and liquor dealers. During the First World War, the anti-Jewish stereotype was embellished, with the Jew being identified as a military shirker, and after the Russian Revolution, as a subversive Bolshevik. Thus, a Russian-Jewish conspiracy was the way leading newspapers depicted South Africa's major labor strikes in 1922 under the Gratis the so-called Rand Revolt. By the mid-1920s, newspapers began to question the potential for Eastern European Jews to integrate into South African society. Unassimilability became the new catchword, an idea influenced directly by nativist literature and nativist ideas from the United States, as well as by a new domestic segregationist discourse in which race and culture were conflated. The anti-Jewish stereotype was thus intimately bound up with the local stresses and upheavals engendered by South Africa's mineral revolution. For many categories of the social spectrum, the impoverished farmer, the unemployed worker, the competing merchant, the frustrated businessman, the fearful worker, the stereo served as a psychological cushion. It was a universal scapegoat in an age of turmoil. I'm going to jump now to the Jewish question of the 1930s and early 1940s. Against the backdrop of <coughs> the evolution of the anti-Jewish stereotype, it was no surprise that the full spectrum of the English and Afrikaans language press welcomed the Quota Act of 1930, which set out to curtail Eastern European Jewish immigration. The act heralded, in Todd Endelman's terms, the transformation of private into public or programmatic anti-Semitism. That is to say, anti-Semitism moved from relatively benign cultural and literary stereotyping to the public arena with demands for political action. The transformation was initially seen in the formation of the Grey Shirts, a far-right movement under the leadership of Louis Weichardt. At its peak, it numbered about 2,000 members, and its success inspired similar organizations to mushroom across the country. Although inspired by Nazi forms and racist or folkish discourse, the substantive message 
of South Africa's fascist movements related to the South African experience. Jews had fomented the Boer War, inspired blacks against white civilization, controlled the press, exploited Afrikaners, dominated society, and so forth. Against a backdrop of drought, depression, and rapidly increasing black economic competition, these fascist clones with the marked preference for the language and symbolism of Nazism, devoted themselves to attacking that oldest of scapegoats, <coughs> the Jew. Indeed, a variation of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion appeared in 1934, leading to a major libel action against the leader of the Grey Shirts, Johannes von Moltke. Anti-Jewish ideas rapidly moved from the extreme right to the mainstream of Afrikaner nationalism, exacerbated by the influx of German Jewish refugees who found a loophole in the earlier Quota Act which did not apply to them. <coughs> the groundswell of anti-Jewish feeling prompted demands for the ending of Jewish immigration. These developments galvanized the ruling United Party, that's the party of, of Jan Smuts, to introduce stiff educational and financial requirements for purposes of immigration. And these were to take effect on the 1st of November 1936 and resulted in an interim increase in German-Jewish immigration. By the end of October, well-attended meetings led by a group of Stellenbosch University professors, including H.F. Wood, later the architect of apartheid, these meetings protested against the arrival, and particularly a ship-bearing immigrants, the Stuttgart. At that time, on the far right, Weichardt predicted that our party is about to make a strong and rapid advance. Everywhere our meetings are crowded, and our message is eagerly welcomed by the people. So fringe sentiment was gradually integrated into the core of the political program of the purified <coughs> National Party at that time in opposition. That's the party that would come to power in 1948 and develop its apartheid policies. But certainly for that party, at least in some quarters, they were calling for special action against recent Jewish arrivals, including restrictions on property rights and on access to the professions. These arguments were predicated upon Jewish unassimilability and fears of Jewish power and domination. In an obvious response to flourishing anti-Semitism, coupled with a private bill introduced by D.F. Malone, who had become the first Prime Minister of the apartheid state in 1948, there were attempts to stiffen naturalization laws, and the United Party introduced an Aliens Act designed to restrict Jewish immigration, particularly from Germany, <coughs> without mentioning Jews by name. Immigrants were to be permitted entry by a selection board on the grounds of good character and the likelihood of assimilation into the <coughs> European population. But that wasn't enough for the purified nationalists. For them, any Jewish immigration was unacceptable. Thus, the party leader, Malum, spelt out the whole corpus of anti-Jewish thought at the time to a university audience in 1937 when he related Jews as the problem in South Africa. And the Jewish question rapidly became a central plank in the platform of the radical right. Under pressure at the time from the far right, grey shirts and other <coughs> fascist movements. The Jew was increasingly employed as an explanation for the Afrikaners' misfortunes. But it was Favut who stood at the vanguard of anti-Jewish agitation. In a major editorial in the newspaper he edited called the Transvaal, he summarized <coughs> the whole corpus of anti-Semitic discourse. Jewish domination in business and professions, the unassimilability of Jews, Jewish alienation from the Afrikaners, questionable Jewish commercial morality, and the use of money by Jews to influence government through the English language press. Obviously, 
the Jewish question was no longer a concern solely of fringe fascist groups, it was now firmly entrenched within white politics. Malone's nationalists predictably stressed the Jewish problem in the 1938 general election campaign. Party propaganda was underpinned by an insistence on the prospect of Jewish domination. <coughs> and the election year also saw the emergence of a paramilitary authoritarian movement, the Ossobad Rampfart, the OB or the Oxwagon Sentinel, which was born out of the centenary celebrations of the Great Trek, that central moment in Afrikaner history in the 19th century, when Afrikaners moved to the interior of the country to get away from the English and get land. The Ossobad Brandtwag attacked so-called British Jewish Masonic imperialism and capitalism, British Jewish democracy, Jewish money power, and Jewish disloyalty. And it associated Jews with communism as well. <clears throat> the rhetoric of protest and opposition was thus riddled with racist assumptions and anti-Semitic generalizations. Jews were aliens, disloyal, and bent on exploitation or subversion. Hostility was driven largely by Afrikaner intellectuals, some of whom had studied in Germany, where they imbibed views of the corporate state, an idealist worldview, and a sense of exclusivist nationalism. These ideas propelled a powerful republicanism rooted in notions of divine election, a leitmotif within the Afrikaner civil religion. Like their European counterparts on the far right, Afrikaner nationalists were opposed to liberalism, Marxism, and laissez-faire capitalism, which was associated with British imperialism and exemplified in the Oppenheimer character I referred to earlier, who was clearly English-speaking, imperialist, and Jewish. National sentiment, in other words, sharpened perceptions of the Jew as a quintessential alien. For the far-right Afrikaner symbolized all that was foreign and oppressive. And moreover, as English speakers, for the most part, Jews were political enemies. But the Jew did help consolidate an all-embracing Afrikaner identity, understood in terms of cultural unity, national roots, and opposition to the foreigner. In this way, anti-Semitism helped in some way to cover or paper over class divisions and antagonisms within Afrikaner society. The Afrikaner's inferior status in society and his poverty could be explained in racial or national terms. By employing this discourse of race to exclude and denigrate Jews, the Afrikaner was in turn elevated. Consequently, it's no coincidence that anti-Semitism continued to suffuse specifically right-wing Afrikaner political discourse and programs. This despite the improvements in the economy from the mid-1930s. And it's also no coincidence that the Jewish question was tied to internecine Afrikaner struggles employed according to prevailing needs and power gains. Anti-Semitism was given further impetus following the South African Parliament's decision to support the Commonwealth's war effort to resist Germany in 1939. A powerful anti-war movement was orchestrated by the Ossobad Brandtwag, in which the appeal of fascism, and with it the rhetoric of anti-Semitism, was ever-present. A range of major national party publications issued in the early 1940s demonstrated the formative influence of Mussolini and Hitler on the exclusive nature of an insurgent Afrikaner nationalism in which the Jew had no place. Certainly the Osaba Brandtwag saw the Jews as a specific racial grouping in South Africa. But the struggle against Hitler gradually eroded the warm reception accorded to Nazi and fascist ideas. By 1942, mainstream national popular <coughs> leaders, including Malang, Favut, and Stregel, the later Prime Minister, these ideas were unequivocally rejected uh, by these Afrikaners, the ideas of National Socialism, at any rate. Nevertheless, there were indications that as late as 1944, anti-Semitism was still a powerful force. 
But the ultimate knowledge of the final solution demonstrated its dangers. So what we've seen then in the 1930s is a sea change in the nature and character of anti-Semitism. Hostility had moved from the private or ideational sphere into the public or party political realm. And the transformation was unquestionably related to specific traumas in the 1930s. I'm thinking of the intensification of the poor white problem following the impact upon South Africa of the World Depression, the emergence of Nazism in Europe, and most importantly, the rise of an illiberal, anti-modernist, and exclusivist strain <coughs> within Afrikaner nationalism. That anti-Semitism rapidly disappeared after the war. The grey shirts and the new order, another fascist group, were disbanded. And the ban on Jewish membership in the National Party in one of the provinces where they had been banned was lifted in 1951. And in 1953, the first apartheid Prime Minister Malam returned from a visit to Israel full of praise and admiration for the Jewish people. The National Party appeared to want to put the tensions and excesses of the 1930s and 1940s behind it. A new Afrikaner bourgeoisie, well-educated, confident, and more optimistic than their forebears, enjoyed the economic fruits of racist exploitation and political power. They developed very rapidly a respect for enterprise and material success. The very scaffolding that had underpinned the Afrikaner's sense of inferiority was thus removed as they began to experience power and upward mobility. Within a decade of coming to power, a broad Afrikaner middle class had appeared. A sense of competition with and fear of the Jew dissipated. A post-war consumerist culture meant the erosion of rural values and a newfound respect for the city. No longer was it an alien and inhospitable place. Most significantly, however, the impetus of exclusivist Afrikaner nationalism waned. English speakers, including Jews, were necessary for the apartheid project. As whites, Jews were to have a rightful and welcome place. In the post-war South African world, color was the cardinal divide and the greatest source of Afrikaner fear. Anti-Semitism was relegated to occasional uttering on the part of the far right, <coughs> including concerns about Jewish loyalty at the time Israel supported the Africa bloc in the early 1960s against apartheid, and including some Holocaust denial at the far right in the 1970s. At this time, however, a new source of hostility began to emerge around the question of Zionism driven essentially, but not exclusively, by the minority Muslim population, around about 2% of the population. In apartheid of South Africa, the views of this community were largely unknown to whites, including Jews, because of the nature of the society, uh, people were sealed off from one another in the strict racial order that existed. Jews were certainly unaware that common episodes and events were viewed in distinctive and predictably different ways. From the earliest days of the British mandate, Muslims took a very different view to Jews. For them, the Israeli War of Independence was a catastrophe, the so-called Nakba, and this was exacerbated by further Israeli victories against Arab forces, culminating in the Six-Day War. In short, South African Muslims shared in the humiliation of their Muslim brothers and sisters. Jews, on the other hand, unquestioningly empathized with the Jewish state, fully supported to recent times, that is, the Jewish state, by the white-owned and Eurocentric media. Although Zionism was a term of opprobrium and Israel was seen to be an aggressive state, the Muslim communal leadership was largely quiescent till the late 1960s. This leadership was increasingly challenged by a younger generation of Muslims galvanized by
by the charged political atmosphere of the 1970s. I'm talking about the wider context of the 70s, including the Soweto uprising in 76. Inspired by new radical teachings and the 1976 African student uprisings, and buttressed by Khomeinism and the international Muslim struggle against imperialism, this younger generation read the writings of Madhuri and Kutu. For them, secularism, the West, and deviant Arab regimes were all targeted. A fortnightly newspaper, Muslim News, later called Muslim Views, and other Muslim publications increasingly vilified Zionist intrusion and commented increasingly on the tragedy of Palestine. Muslims were warned regularly about Zionist designs and familiarized with the protocols of the elders of Zion. The equating of Zionism with racism at the UN in 76 was hailed as a victory for the PLO and a defeat for the United States and Israel. By the late 1970s, a Palestinian Islamic Solidarity Committee had been established in Durban and the Muslim Youth Movement, the MYM, had embarked on a thorough training schedule, including study programs, special camps and manuals, all linked intricately with international Islamic research of literature and tapes. Zionism, secularism, capitalism, and communism were all identified as threats. Impetus was added by the success of the Iranian Revolution in 1979. The writings of Shariati and Khomeini were now included in the reading lists of these movements. In 1980, a radical group, Kibla, was founded patently inspired by the overthrow of the Shah in Iran and palpably informed by global perspectives on the potential for challenging the South African state from a Muslim perspective, it spoke of Islamic revolution in South Africa. Never on the cards, and still not on the cards, by sheer virtue of numbers, and as I'll explain later, one can't generalize from a few. Muslim demonstrations against Israel and Zionism on the campuses of the University of Cape Town and the University of Advertisement at the time of the Sabra and Shatila massacres in Lebanon revealed an intensification of Muslim anti-Zionism and a new determination for action among the younger generation. The growth of radical Islam was especially evident in the objection of some Muslims to being part of the broad-based anti-apartheid coalition the United Democratic Front, the UDF, which was founded in 1983. These Muslim voices were concerned that the UDF included non-Muslims, communists, amoral secularists, and Zionists, and this would lead to a dilution of Muslim identity. Of particular concern was the Zionist question. By the 1980s, progressive South Africans shared a powerful mood of anti-colonialism embedded in a third world Weltanschauung. Within this framework, the illegitimacy of Zionism was an important component, especially given the fact that South Africa had close ties from the early 1970s with Israel. This mindset was capitalized upon by Kibler, which identified Zionism as the citadel of imperialism. For some observers, Jewish and Zionist manipulation was even responsible for apartheid. By the late 1980s, Muslims were increasingly visible in anti-apartheid protest marches. But once the ban on illegal organizations had been lifted by President de Klerk in 1990, these Muslims widened their focus to include Bosnia, Kashmir, and Palestine. The United States embassies and the Israelis embassies embassy were regular targets of anger and Israel's links to the United States always noted. Muslims equated the struggle for liberation in South Africa with the Palestinian struggle. <coughs> Both were revolutions against colonial settler states dominated by the United States. And of course, Muslims in South Africa would have been categorized as not white and were the victims of apartheid and its legislation. The arch enemy of Islam and the root cause of problems in the Middle East was Israel. As one newspaper put it, the Zionists 
through their servants, the Americans, have manipulated the situation in the Middle East to such an extent that they have succeeded in leaving the Middle East totally defenseless. Hostility gained pace at the time of the Gulf War, evident in the conflict on the campuses between Jewish students and Muslim students, and in solidarity meetings for the Bosnian Muslims at which American and Israeli flags were burned. And the tempo was continued when Yasser Arafat visited in 1994, speaking in a mosque in Johannesburg. He called on South African Muslims to join the struggle to liberate Jerusalem. Jihad will continue, he said. You have to fight and start the Jihad to liberate Jerusalem, your sacred shrine. And one year later on Al-Quds Day, placards were displayed outside the Israeli embassy in Cape Town reading, kill a Jew, kill an Israeli, and Jewish blood. And not surprisingly, the assassination of Rabin was greeted as a miracle from God, according to Muslim views. By then, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was undoubtedly the central concern of Muslims in South Africa. The Jewish state was a focus of evil and a conspiratorial center rooted in the Zionist movement. Such sentiments were articulated at an international Muslim conference held in Pretoria in 1996 called Creating a New Civilization of Islam. And speakers there referred to the Jews as a powerful economic force and blamed Zionists for all evils in society. And this is the context in which PAGAD, an acronym for People Against Gangsterism and Crime, was founded, a vigilante movement which built upon mounting despair as law and order broke down in the aftermath of apartheid's demise, the loosening of the police state, and activated by a prior history of gangsterism in the townships. And PAGAD appeared to provide solutions against a background of poverty, unemployment, Muslims marched to the homes of gang leaders and offered Islam as the only solution. When voices were raised against Pagad's activities, these were blamed on global conspiracy. And when the African National Congress, now in power of the Party of Liberation, when it issued a document, The Threat of Fundamentalist Islam. One, Fuad Rahman, who is not well known by anyone, but interesting from our point of view, he responded in the columns of Muslim views that the document produced by the ANC was a product of, quote, the Israeli intelligence network known as Mossad. The ANC government, according to Rahman, is heavily influenced and controlled by Zionists. Of course, that wouldn't have had much traction. But he continued that Mossad was working hand in glove with the CIA due to the extensive surveillance of Muslims here, knew about Pagad before Pagad knew about Pagad. <laughs> now, Rachman's conspiratorial views knew no bounds, and he reflected an increasingly paranoid cast of mind. South Africa's moral collapse was linked, in his view, to the apostate, as it happens, Jewish mining magnate, Harry Oppenheimer, the, as he put it, Reichmann put it, South African equivalent to the American moneymonger known as Rockefeller, who due to his wealth and owning America, dictates American policy. Oppenheimer was accused of being a Zionist, manipulating American President Bill Clinton and defining his anti-Islamic policies. He went on to say, this is why America, used and under control by the Zionist conspiracy, has ousted the popularly voted in FIS government in Algeria and replaced it with the puppet Yes Boss dictator. In Rachman's view, South Africa was also being manipulated by Zionists, whom he alleged in addition to controlling the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, had infiltrated major ANC government structures with so-called white liberals sitting in key positions. He went on to say, I'm quoting, the Oppenheimer family 
main, uh, dictates global economy trends due to the wealth of all South Africans they have usurped. He, that is Oppenheimer, is also linked to a major Zionist structure conspiring to dictate world policy due to owning the world's wealth. Rachman even blamed the demise of the National Party, the Party of Apartheid, which relinquished power in 1994, he blamed its demise on the Zionists and ensured readers that the Zionists would similarly make the ANC incapable of governing. And this would, as he put it, ensure greater money control on the wealth of the nation. So Muslims then were well informed by Mr. Rahman and did not contradict in the press this tirade of conspiratorial peace. They continued to focus on the Middle East and continued to burn flags at every opportunity. In 1994, the Islamic Unity Convention was founded by Ahmed Qasim, an anti-apartheid activist who had spent a number of spells in jail, including Robben Island, where Nelson Mandela was kept. Qasim had also been a political prisoner. And his movement, the Islamic Unity Convention, claimed to be a union of 200 groups. Uh, they took very much a line supporting Hamas, had regular protests, and appealed to Nelson Mandela to deal with the Palestinian question. The hostile mood was exacerbated by the breakdown in the Israeli-Palestinian Oslo peace process. In this atmosphere, even an invitation to the new National Party Mayor of Cape Town, the Cape Metropolitan Council, to attend an international mayoral conference in Israel in May 1998. This led to a fiery debate and heavy pressure on the mayor from Muslim organizations, supported, I might say, by the ANC's provincial caucus, that he should not accept the invitation. In the context of such tensions, it was quite predictable that the Israeli Jubilee celebrations in Cape Town were marred by Muslim <coughs> protests and a letter from the Secretary General of the Muslim Judicial Council, the central body representing the Muslim population, claimed that it was appalling for any South African to share in the celebration of Jews and Zionists on the occasion of the Jubilee. And the mood was further inflamed with the uh, when the government refused a visa to Sheikh Yassin, then the spiritual leader of Hamas. But he did have a telephone interview from Kuwait, which was broadcast from a Muslim radio station, and further inflamed people and increased the call for death to Israel, and one Zionist, one bullet, which of course echoed the well-known refrain from the Pan-Africanist Congress, one settler, one bullet. So, the by now well-organized Muslim community continued to explain its views on Zionism in terms of conspiracy theories built upon notions of a new world order and the scapegoating of Muslims. Zionists were at the core of global problems, again evident in the Second Intifada, when calls were made on the South African government to cut ties with Israel. There were widespread demonstrations for the Second Intifada, and this laid the foundations for further radicalization, which of course reached its apogee in the now infamous Durban United Nations Conference in August 2001. There was huge international support, and the occasion, as you well know, turned into an extension of the Arab Israeli <coughs> conflict and an opportunity for those present, most of those present, to portray Israel and the Zionist ideology as evil incarnate. Durban became, in the words of Erwin Kotler, who spoke here recently, Durban became a byword for racism and anti-Semitism. Given the tempo of the times, it's not surprising that many Muslims following 9-11 uh, took their conspiratorial ideas further. Zionist connections with the USA were always identified and what was in essence a political conflict over disputed territory 
at least for some, was turning into a cosmological struggle. And this was well captured in an interview in September 2004 when a young uh, Cape Town cleric studying, a Muslim cleric studying at the al aqsa Institute in Cairo, he referred in his talk to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, noted that Jews controlled the economic systems of the world, all our land, all the means of the radio stations, the newspapers, the televisions, they are continuing, they are controlling all these things, and this is how they have full control over the whole world. Now, let me try and tease out some of the continuities and the discontinuities and the contingencies operating in this 20th century survey. By examining particular moments of hostility towards Jews through the century, it becomes apparent that the purveyors of hate change cast over time. Anti-alienism or hostility towards the Eastern European Jewish immigrants emanated essentially from the white English-speaking merchant class and from Afrikaner farmers. The Jewish question in the 1930s and 1940s built upon classic anti-Jewish motifs. It was very much the concern of the white Afrikaner right. And of course, hostility towards Zionism emanates largely, but not exclusively, from the Muslim community, which by and large, as I mentioned earlier, falls within the non-white category of the old apartheid racial order. The English-speaking community never bought into the Jewish question as such, and anti-Semitism, as I've indicated among the Afrikaners, effectively disappeared once the National Party gained political success in 1948. In each of these phases of hostility, it's apparent that perceptions of the Jew were informed at least in part by ideas and intellectual traditions from beyond South Africa. And this is hardly surprising. The period of anti-alienism at the start of the century was an age of increasing literacy, improved communications and large population migrations, specifically between Britain and South Africa. The penetration of European ideas was inevitable, including the anti-Jewish stereotype. And a vaguely racial definition of Jewishness ensured that those traits traditionally associated with Jews would be ascribed to their co-religionists in South Africa. The impact of European ideas was particularly apparent in the 1930s. The radical right, as I've indicated, manifestly shared many fascist ideas, evident in the shortest movements, most famously the Gratians, also in the Osobar Brandtwak and the New Order, and evident in the penetration of the protocols of the of Zion into South Africa. Local anti-Semites were well connected to a nexus of international anti-Semitism, demonstrable in the Protocols trial in 1934. One of those charged, von Molke, claimed he was inspired by Hitler's revolution, but even more influenced by a fellow Hamel, Hamilton Hamish Beamish, a well-known Irish-born anti-Semite who had found his way to the Cape Colony as a member of the Ceylon Mountain Infantry during the World War before returning to England via the old Rhodesia where he founded the anti-Semitic Britons in England. Von Moltke was acquainted with Beamish's writings and the Irishman Beamish gave supporting evidence at the trial. Muslim anti-Zionism also displayed and displays currently features of the conspiratorial cast of mind and it too was influenced by ideas from abroad. Intricate Muslim international networks shared ideas of hatred and fantasy, including Holocaust denial. The success of the Jewish state, despite its pariah status for many, had to be explained. The groundwork was well laid in a global literature that demonized Jews, Israel, and the United States. All this connected smoothly with the protocols facilitated by the internet hateful sites, including South African sites. As important as the impact of ideas from outside on domestic discourse about Jews and Zionism were the specific contingencies within which these ideas operated and resonated. 
anti-alienism during the upheavals of the mineral revolution and the demonstrable power of mining capital, anti-Semitism during the 1930s and early 1940s during a period of heightened Afrikaner ethno-nationalism, and anti-Zionism in a highly charged and hospitable political milieu at a time of radical transition. Although Muslims identified with the notion of Nakba at the time of the Israeli War of Independence, and although they shared in the humiliation of Arab defeats at the hands of Israeli forces, it was only as I've indicated from the 1970s that a younger generation operating in a different political milieu began to find explanations for their condition in radical Islamist literature. South African Muslims increasingly viewed the plight of fellow Muslims in the world through a South African template, fed by radical Islamist thought from abroad. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict and American machinations in the Middle East, in particular, informed a sense of common victimhood exacerbated by a second-class status in apartheid South Africa. Notwithstanding the importance of contingent factors, the rhetoric and motifs of hostility to Jews through the century had much in common. The target, Jew or Zionist, was identified as responsible for the evils of the day. At the turn of the century, for undermining standards and for nefariously manipulating society, in the 1930s and early 1940s, for threatening to dominate and to control society. In the late 20th century, for malevolently orchestrating global affairs and oppressing Palestinians in a quest for domination. In this sense, radical Muslims in South Africa shared much with Hobson and with the Afrikaner radical right in the interwar years. Like the Hobsonians and the Shirtists, they evolved fantasies to cope with and to understand their world. In the case of Muslims, the added experience of living under a centrally controlled, authoritarian and manipulative apartheid regime exacerbated beliefs in conspiracy and intrigue. It's tempting to note that Hobson's Boer War, von Moltke's Protocol of the Elders of Zion and Rachman's conspiracies each have a bearing on what Daniel Pipes refers to as the great radical utopian ideologies of our century. That is to say, Leninism, Fascism, and Islamism. Each of these ideologies, argues Pipes, harnesses ideas of world domination. They are each informed by a world conspiracy ideology and attempt to dominate the world. And yet, ironically, each of these ideologies sees others, and more specifically the Jew, as conspiring to challenge them and plotting to dominate the world. In short, what we have, we have what psychologists commonly refer to as projection. Thus, Hobson's understanding of imperialism captivated Lenin, who refined the idea of monopoly capitalism and its threat as part of a communist worldview. The protocols, in turn, informed Hitler and Nazism and served, in the classic phrase of Norman Kahn, as a warrant for genocide. And Islamists understand their struggle in apocalyptic terms that relate directly to the protocols. Israel, or the Jewish state, serves as the locus of their fantasy. Hobson and the radical left of 1900 and the Afrikaner radical right of the 1930s had no such tangible or available target. The historical hand has moved on. But the hidden hand of the Jew remains. So, um, is anybody on the test? So, questions? Ed? Uh, what percentage of the South African population is represented by Jews over this entire time period? Has it been relatively stable? Has it always been within? A half a percentage point or something? Thank you. I should have indicated the Jews at their height numbered 118,000, and as a percentage of the so called white population at their height, 4.7%. Oh, 
118. 118, yes, 118,000. But as they are, today they number about 75 or 80,000. A minuscule part of less than half a percent of the total population, much less. And uh, the Muslims, as I indicated, are today about 800,000. So it's a small community, and of course, they don't all subscribe to these, these views. Although Zionism, or hostility to Zionism, is a common glue, but the majority of Muslims draw on a much more ecumenical Islamic tradition and not the conspiratorial tradition that I've been identifying. So the, the reason I ask is, although the specifics, of course, are very different with South Africa from other countries, we've now had several talks from people who have, have come through and, and told us about anti Semitism in Russia or in, in the Muslim world, even in Canada. and you, there, there, there's always uh, a common ending, basically, which is the Jews seem to be the perfect scapegoats. And so the, the question that I keep asking myself is why? Uh, and, and so what, what, what are sort of the necessary features? And one of them has got to be that if you're going to spread all sorts of stories about a group, conspiracy theories and so forth, there can't be too many such people because then it would be very easy to see if the conspiracy theories are wrong. It's much easier to make things up about small groups. Uh, which led me to the following thought, was there any other group in South Africa over this time period which shared this type, the sort of discrimination that you've described against the Jews? Obviously blacks were put down for these, but uh, was there any sort of small select group which also, uh, from many different points of view, from the right, from the left, what have you, uh, shared, shared in this sort of discrimination. There, there would no doubt be ugly stereotypes about groups between, between different segments of the population, but not the controlling sort of idea of, of manipulating society. I can't think. One year's occasion of the Illuminati in small circles, um, one spoke about the yellow peril, the Chinese immigration as a concern, but I can't think of any group that has been the subject as a minority in the way the Jews have been. Okay. Um, just a point, if you can nod to me, I'll sort of keep the list of questions. And I want to ask you a question as well. Um, so given the impact of colonialism on European political, socioeconomic domination of Southern Africa, and the missionaries and the Christianization of Southern Africa, what impact, if any, has anti-Semitism had on the indigenous African population? When it comes to black anti-Semitism, uh, we don't know too much. In 1972, there was a study done by a Melville Eagleson, who was the first white person killed by a mob at the time of the Soweto uprising. He had been by a liberal fellow who had been working in the townships and did a study of matriculation students in the Soweto high school. And he found that the Jews were very low on the order in other words, they were disliked. Only the Afrikaans were disliked more. And he tried to explain it in terms of Christian missionary teaching. Um, I'm not sure if that's altogether satisfactory. Or no, I'm, I'm, you don't see much in the literature about Jews. Very often you see positive things. But in the Zionist question, you've got a very different setup. Um, the broad population, uh, in sort of third world knee-jerk response, sees the Middle East through a spectrum or South African template in which, as I indicated, the Palestinians are seeking liberation as did the Africans in South Africa. Uh, a lot resonates with these people. For example, the idea of holding on to an ethnic state as the Jews wish to uh, echoes the Afrikaner ethnic state. The fence or the wall has all sorts of resonances with apartheid and the Balkanization or cantonization of the territories resonates with apartheid homelands. So for the South Africans, the, the broadly anti-Zionist worldview is very powerful indeed, although the official policy is a two-state solution, accepts a secure Jewish state alongside a Palestinian state, and I understand that is because the United Nations takes that view, and South Africa follows a multilateral foreign policy in which the UN would be very important. But the, the template is very much a South African one. Um, to what degree did Mandela and Mandela Baking pay attention to this tiny 
Muslim community in terms of their anti-Semitism? Uh, that's one question. Um, and then you emphasize the, the far right during the 1930s, the extreme right. Where did Herzog stand, who was the Prime Minister until 1939? Okay, two questions. The, the current situation with, with Mandela and Mbeki, with response to... To this Muslim to you. The ANC, with its long history of opposition to racism, is fully against any notion of classical anti-Semitism. It's an environment in today in a society self-styled as the rainbow nation in which anti-Semitism in its classical form would have no future in that sense. In its form of anti-Zionism, to the extent that that's a debate, and of course you know that well, now that could be different. But classical anti-Semitism would not be accepted by Mandela, not by the ANC. It's a form of prejudice which they fought long and hard against for close to 100 years. Now they are concerned about Islamism. The vigilante group I referred to, Pagate, People Against Gangsters and Drugs, was taken very seriously by the, the ANC and it led to the uh, 740 pipe bombs going off in the Western Cape region of Muslim against Muslim, including progressive academics who were concerned with gender issues in Islam, one of them ending up at Duke University, holding a very fine career there. But his house was firebombed and he left Cape Town. Now that was of great concern to the ANC in the, in the late 1990s. And they took action, police action, and quelled it. But they do take it seriously. But it does represent a minority because there's a, there's a long uh, part of the resistance struggle includes Muslims. And those Muslims have fought for constitutional Western-style democracy. So it's not an Islamist movement, or the vast majority of Muslims in the country are quite happy in a multicultural, multi-faith society and would not support any Islamization of the society. But what's disturbing is that you do not get the sort of response one would hope for in the mainstream Muslim press to the outrageous conspiratorial claims, the kind of which are read some. <laughs> On Herzog, he was with Smuts very much, and they felt the, the pressures from the far right, and, and he went along with the Aliens Act, Herzog. But he, he, there's not much evidence to my knowledge of him really sharing those views, but during the war when he broke away... Right. So, ultimately then, the sort of mainstream Afrikaners did not agree with the extreme, with the right-wing extremists and their anti-Semitism? Well, the Afrikaner historian, Helmut Hillelian, mm -hmm. who you know, mm -hmm. well, um, he and I have had a, a disagreement about the extent of anti-Semitism. Uh, he feels it was very, very marginal and, and just instrumental in its, in its use. Um, there were calls to limit and control in some sectors of the party the, the Jewish position in South Africa. And they had some inveterate anti-Semites in important positions including the apartheid early foreign minister, Eric Lowe, who was uh, died in the wool anti-Semite, and, uh, and others. Uh, Malan soon put his anti-Semitism behind him, the first prime minister, but for what had written substantially on, on, on the Jews. Uh, could you comment on the role of Jewish intellectuals in the university system in South Africa? Sure. Um, generally, uh, Jews have been prominent uh, from the second generation, increasingly. The immigrant generation obviously not going to university. The next generation increasingly going into, well, mostly they don't go into the universities, but those that do go into the universities play a prominent role, particularly in law and medicine, particularly. Um, they virtually, to the, to the end, were liberals opposed to apartheid, and the intellectuals, the next generation, were very often informed by uh, European Marxism, were prominent in the humanities and the social sciences, part of the new left, 
informed by those ideas, very often falling into the category of Isaac Deutsch as non-Jewish Jews, mm. but playing an important role intellectually in the humanities. And uh, some of the most prominent ANC intellectuals uh, were Jewish. And South African Communist Party. Uh, during the uh, period when the, the rest of the world was applying possible divestment, uh, including uh, Yale in its portfolio, I was on the committee that looked at the application of the Sullivan Principles to South Africa. And I had the impression that we looked at particular companies that some of the best behaved companies were in fact uh, run by Jews. Uh, there may be a wrong impression but the impression I got from looking at some of the prominent big companies. The question is whether or not uh, this played favorably in terms of the attitude of the ANC and the resistance uh, with respect to the Jewish question. I, I don't think it made a major impact, but I do think that the prominence of Jews in the anti-apartheid struggle did make an impact. For example, in the 1950s, in the so-called treason trial, 156 uh, people were arrested, charged with treason. Of the 156, 23 were white, and of the 23, 14 or 15 were Jewish. Now, if you read some of the memoir literature, um, the ANC <coughs> recognizes those Jews and remembers them as being prominent in the struggle. Of course, from the point of view of the Jewish community, these Jews were often ostracized um, as, in the apartheid days, placing the Jew in the spotlight and threatening their well-being. And the general reason it uh, set up is if you take a continuum, the more activists they were, the less Jewish they were in that sense. Mm -hmm. Jews by tradition. They weren't ashamed to say they're Jewish. And many of them have come back from exile and played an important role. Uh, Judge L.B. Sachs in the Constitutional Court and, and many, many others, and quite happy to be integrated into the Jewish community in, in whatever way it is. And Sussman was a big figure. Helen Sussman was a mainstream liberal, and on the question of divestment, she was opposed to divestment. Uh, as was the leader of the opposition, who walked out of Parliament in 1985, Van Sallet. Uh, at that point, the argument used by those people with regards to divestment was that you don't know when it's going to end and you could actually destroy the whole country and never rebuild it. That was the argument against it, which you will believe. I did get a sense from your talk of how the Jewish population does politically, economically, or socially uh, in South Africa. Could you address that? Sure. Um, it is a, a very successful community by all measures, very much the North American model. Immigrants, children going into universities, uh, professionalizing, business, innovative, moving into avenues that were undeveloped like uh, manufacturing, retail stores, and it, it's very much the, the Canadian North American experience and uh, very highly skilled and well, relatively well, without great class divisions in, in the last 30, 40 years, which is not to say they aren't poor Jews, but that. Uh, I'd like to make a comment and ask a question. When I was in, in, in Cape Town in the year 2000, I visited the Holocaust Museum, which uh, has actually quite a substantial uh, display on the history of apartheid. No as part of its um, uh, the entire museum. Uh, my question is about the Muslims. Uh, what, what is the ethnic background? Are they, are they black uh, Muslims? Are they, are they Pakistani, Arabs? Uh, what, what is the ethnic background? The Muslims are the descendants of slaves from Indonesia, maybe. Mm -hmm. The islands around them. Mm -hmm. So they're not Pakistani, they're not the subcontinent. And they've been around, there's been substantial conversion in the 18th and 19th centuries, and they've never really had an increase on an immigrant population. But in the last 10 years, there's been an influx of Pakistanis, as the whole country has opened up. The Apartheid Museum is interesting. I was involved, at least the, the Holocaust Center, with that opening part on Apartheid, uh, dealing with the Holocaust 
exhibition or commemoration in South Africa necessitates relating in some way to apartheid. It's, it's a very awkward thing. And that was the one way we could do it by locating race and race ideology in a common source. I was impressed by that. Thank you, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've met a, uh, was one, an Israeli from originally from Rhodesia in Zimbabwe. And I remember a report citing that there very few Jews left there. And um, at one point it was a fairly substantial, successful community. So how did it differ if, if, if you dropped from 118,000 to 75,000? That's a drop. But their percentage of alpha pyramid is much more severe. Yes, the, the, the Zimbabweans with the Mugabe liberation struggle in the 70s, there was a legislative change uh, with regard to military activity. And I remember a lot of young people left the country, a lot of whites, including Jews, to avoid that. Um, so that was a, a, a major drop off. They were going to face that problem. It's only a, it was also a very tiny population, to start. a very tiny white population generally. I just ask, uh, what is the local Jewish involvement in the diamond industry on the internet? You know, are they mainly, are you mainly into the normal uh, businesses and uh, academia and uh, they, they are. Um, I mean, they have historically been involved with diamonds and beers and going back to the And they're not massively today. So they're basically a, a service group yeah, to that's they're they're not, not involved. They have been prominent the CEOs place. of certain companies. <laughs> Yes, I think Rury has had a Jewish CEO, but they're not that big in Anglo-American Jews. Much more service manufacturing. Retail, chain scale, so they're more like a paper community in New York. I'm sorry, I have a follow-up question to this. It's the ethnicity of the Muslims. I'm baffled why Indonesian, I mean, I say the sentence of Indonesian I mentioned that they widened their focus uh, in the early 90s. Israel, Palestine became the issue. It's a much more tangible issue. It gets much greater media coverage and it had much more meaning for the Islamists in that sense. But of late, I sense under pressure there's been a move to consider Darfur. For example, the Muslim press has been covering that substantially because they have been accused of why exactly your question, why are you focusing only on that? So I think there's a slight sensitivity, but the, the Israeli question is paramount. And it does resonate. There's um, been some very strongly anti-Zionist expressions by individual members of the government, and I think particularly of, of one, Ronnie Kazriel, who happens to be Jewish. Are they simply expressing their views as individuals in such cases, and is that nothing to do with any issues within the government or directions that may be taken? Well, the person referred to, Ronnie Castles, was, uh, was an exiled uh, member of the Communist Party, came back with the normalization in 1990. Uh, he had grown up with a fairly traditional Jewish background, but soon left that in his late teens. Um, he was very prominent, brave in, in the struggle, and got a senior position in the cabinet. Uh, not a senior post initially, Minister of Water Forestry. But he subsequently has become Minister of Intelligence. 
Now he and a few Jews got together to sign a petition, not in my name, in 2003. It was modeled, I think, on a Belgian group. It was essentially identified as Jews who are distancing themselves from the actions of Zionist Jews. And they did their best to get prominent names on the list. They had to fiddle with the documents. It was launched with much fanfare, in fact, with a parliamentary debate. But it was watered down substantially, allowing people like Nadine Gordeman to sign it. Now, the document, not in my name, was not particularly radical. It accepted a two-state solution, which is the government's policy. And uh, in the whole process, Castrol's in answer to your question, said he was speaking in his own capacity. I've just been to a conference with him, and he makes that very, very clear. That he's speaking, obviously, Minister of Intelligence, it's an important position. And uh, he does it. Why he does it, why he takes such a, such a sort of prominent position is difficult to know. He, he claims, you know, this is part of his tradition of resistance against oppression. But at the same time, he was involved in rendition with a Muslim being sent off to the middle of nowhere, maybe Guantanamo, I'm not sure. And he caused a lot of flack. Now, maybe he connects these two. His, his prominence with the anti-Zionism is enabling him to operate uh, from an intelligence position against Islamism. That sounds a bit conspiratorial on my part. <laughs> <laughs> but he does continue to speak out. And only recently uh, there was a major parliamentary debate with the Lebanese war, in which there was a very ugly uh, anti-Israel resolution. And it often surprises me because Muslims are in important positions in government, and disproportionately in government. It surprises me that the government has held on to the two-state solution. It's not impossible that they will eventually break with that under pressure to appease, even though it's a minority, but a vocal. Well, right. I mean, for example, the, the trade union in South Africa has gone much further than this, and, and this has advocated, you know, a couple of times now, a, a complete boycott. Yes. Kasati, the largest trade union federation, Congress of South African Trade Unions, called for breaking of diplomatic ties, ending of ties. And uh, so there's a wellspring, and again, it, it's this idea of the Middle East replicating South Africa and the liberation. It's, it's also reinforced. I mean, it, it's, 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 it, it, there's this back and forth. If you take a look at anti Israel activists really around the world, it's, it's, it's just a very easy analogy to slip into. I think a lazy analogy to slip, it, slip into, but, but nonetheless, slip into what they do. Yeah. Can you take one more question? No? Okay, so thank you very much. Happy holidays. We don't have a session until November the 30th. So Matthias Pretzel will be coming from Germany and he'll be speaking in Europe on December the 30th.